uh, talking about spondylolisthesis, and I changed it up a little bit. Um, the previous title of this talk is spondylolisthesis and spondyloptosis, and really, it's spondyloptosis is just a uh, continuation of the spondylolisthesis spectrum. So I, I gave it, I'm giving this a little more broad discussion on spondylolisthesis in general. We'll talk a little bit about uh, spondylolisthesis and then its variations, uh, uh, types, and uh, lateralisthesis and retrolisthesis, and uh, kind of summarize after that. So I'll get started. So spondylolisthesis, by definition, uh, we'll break it down to the word down to, to its two parts, spondylo is spine, and listesis is a slip or shift. So it's a translation in the position of one vertebral body in relationship to the adjacent one. And there it can come in various forms. Uh, I put some representative uh, imaging up. Uh, you can have an anterolisthesis, which is the, the, the one that's probably most common, the one we've studied the most, uh, and also have probably the most pathology associated with it. But you can have retrolisthesis, which is one of the uh, superior body sliding posteriorly on the inferior body, and then lateralisthesis, which uh, uh, one body on a AP x-ray will slide to the side. So they all have different pathologies, different, um, <clears throat> different causations, and we'll talk a little bit about each one uh, more, more specifically and, and talk about the different causations uh, and classifications as well. Uh, so let's start with the, the, the subtype of anterolisthesis. Uh, it's the anterior shift of the cephalad vertebra in relationship to the caudal vertebra. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this a non-compensatory sagittal deformity because we're going to talk a little bit about compensatory deformities a little bit with the retrolisthesis and the uh, lateralisthesis uh, variations. But this is essentially a true deformity where, where the, the, the vertebra are shifting to, due to pathologic processes, which are going to be variable based on causation. Uh, they tend, this particular problem tends to cause segmental kyphosis where it occurs. In addition to the displacement of the vertebra itself, it's, it's the most common, uh, probably because it's the most pathologic uh, and it's also the most studied. So we'll talk about how we, how we classify anterolisthesis um, and what causes it. So causations are one classifications uh, uh, system. Uh, Wilty uh, described anterolisthesis as being caused by different types of uh, causations in the spine. Uh, type one is a dysplastic, so there's an abnormality within the uh, upper sacrum or the arch of L5. This is specifically looking at uh, L5-S1 spondylolisthesis. There is ismic with various types of PARS lesions. There's lytic. There is uh, elongated but intact. That's also a form of dysplasia of the PARS. And then you can have acute traumatic fractures of the PARS from injury. Uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis, uh, if you wanted to, we could break this talk into two separate talks because I think degenerative spondylolisthesis is a different issue than an ismic spondylolisthesis, and we're going to talk a little about the two subtypes uh, within the, the anterolisthesis, but degenerative results from uh, longstanding intersegmental disease allowing for one vertebra to shift on, on top of the other. You can have traumatic uh, secondary fractures in regions other than the PARs, as is an apetical fracture can cause a spondylolisthesis or other traumatic injury and then pathologic related to um, uh, localized bone disease or some form of malignancy within the bone that can create a uh, spondylolisthesis. And then there's not one listed here, which is a type six, which we have seen before, which is iatrogenic, uh, often seen after decompression of surgeries, where you'll get a PARS defect that occurs after a decompression and that's got a separate type. So these are the types uh, based on causation of the spondylolisthesis you're gonna see Another way to uh, classify spondylolisthesis is by the degree of the slip that occurs. Um, so basically Meyerding's uh, uh, methodology is to divide the inferior body into four zones, 25% uh, of the total length of the uh, inferior body. Uh, and then basically you have grade one slip is between zero to 25%, grade two slip is 25 to 50% of the body. A grade three slip is uh, 50 to 75 percent. Grade four is 75 to 100 percent of the body, and then uh, finally, uh, spondyloptosis is a complete slip of the vertebra cephalad uh, uh, in front of the vertebra uh, inferiorly. Um, one other way we can measure the degree of a spondylolisthesis is by its slip angle. So it's the angle between the superior edge of the inferior vertebra and the superior edge of the superior vertebra creates the slip angle. And so the higher the slip angle, we'll talk a little bit about deformity in this process, but the higher the slip angle, the greater the deformity associated with the spondylolisthesis. So what's the incidence? How often do we see this condition? Well, again, we had to break it down into different categories. I'm going to, the ISMIC is probably the best studied in terms of its uh, presentation within the adult population. Uh, 
So it's found in about 6% of adolescents and adults. Uh, these are often asymptomatic. In other words, if you take 100 people over age uh, 20 or age 18 and, and get an x-ray, 6% of them will have a spondylolisthesis that is ismic type, where there's a, a problem with the pars into articular layers or some other uh, dysplastic issue with the, the vertebra at that level. The vast majority of people with this condition are asymptomatic. Um, slip progression has been studied, so once it's found, uh, there are 4% slips in lytic defects, 32% uh, worsening slips in dysplastic defects, um, and there's an increased risk of symptoms with the larger slip. So in other words, if a slip progresses, you have an increased risk of developing pain and or neurologic symptoms resulting from that. Uh, the most common level to have an ismic spondylolisthesis is at L5-S1 due to PARS defects or dysplastic defects within the PARS at L5. Uh, and uh, again, progression can occur to the, due to the presence of the PARS defect itself. Degenerative spondylolisthesis is slightly different. This tends to be a disease of, a, of the adults. It's not seen in children. Uh, it's associated with the generalized segmental de degeneration where it occurs. It happens to be four to five times more common in women than men, probably related to uh, ligamentous issues and or uh, specific angles or degenerative changes that occur in women's spines versus men's. It's often associated with spinal stenosis centrally, which ismic spondylolisthesis is not associated with central stenosis generally. Uh, you'll have the typical changes that occur in arthritic changes of the spine with facet and ligamentum hypertrophy associated with this condition. It is also most commonly at L4-5, not at L5-S1. And because the PARS interarticularis are intact within a degenerative spondylolisthesis, these tend to typically be low grade slips, generally not more than a grade two because the, the posterior uh, elements are intact. So how do these conditions present? Well, the degenerative spondylolisthesis tends to present in older patients. Uh, they present with lower back pain. They can present with leg pain. They can present with uh, neurogenic claudication due to stenosis. They can get buttock pain from the same. Uh, and the, uh, the level of the pain tends to correspond to the dermatomal level at the level of the slip. So an L4-5 uh, spondylolisthesis is going to generally give you an L5 clinical uh, picture just because the L5 roots are compressed within the central stenosis. Ismic spondylolisthesis tends to occur in younger patients, although it can occur in older patients. It can present as lower back pain. Generally, if you're going to get uh, nerve neurologic pain, it's gonna be ridiculous because here you're gonna get primarily foraminal stenosis. Remember in a PARS defect, the posterior elements tend to stay where they present or where they should sit. So the, the, the posterior arch stays where it is and then the rest of the spine slips forward from that. So you don't tend to get significant central stenosis associated with ismic spondylolisthesis, but you can get really severe foraminal stenosis as the pedicle of the vertebral body above slides forward and compromises the exiting root within the foramen. Uh, so you get the radicular symptoms. So physical examination uh, in patients with spondylolisthesis, again, is, also, is going to be variable because the diseases are variable. So uh, in a degenerative spondylolisthesis, it's pretty typical, the same presentation for somebody with a spinal stenosis. So they're gonna lean forward to relieve their symptoms. Generally, uh, uh, motor deficits are not associated with the degenerative spondylolisthesis because of the slow nature with which it occurs. So it's pretty well tolerated. Uh, generally, you're going to see if it's an L4-5 degenerative spondylolisthesis, you will see diminishment of ankle reflexes due to stenosis. So knee reflexes will stay normal because the L4 root uh, is not compromised necessarily, but the uh, roots distal to the level are going to be compromised. So you may see normal knee reflexes and diminished ankle reflexes. In the ismic spondylolisthesis, depending on the age of presentation and the severity of the spondylolisthesis, you'll see a variable uh, physical examination presentation. So these patients will often have hamstring tightness due to the uh, presence of the spondylolisthesis, especially in a high grade. These pictures to the right show somebody that's uh, a young child with a, with a high grade spondy. So you can see the change in the contour of the lower back. You can see the bent knee position and the compensation within the pelvis to accommodate the, the fact that when she tries to stand up, she stretches her nerves and there's probably compression and you can see the severity of the spondylolisthesis and the high slip angle associated with this particular spondylolisthesis patient. Um, interestingly, when you palpate the step off of the spinous processes in somebody with an ismic spondylolisthesis at L5-S1, the step off actually occurs at L4-5 because the L5 lamina stays in position as the L5 body slips forward. That is the same palpable step off you'll feel in somebody with the degenerative spondylolisthesis at L4-5.
You can actually have motor deficits associated with a high-grade spondylolisthesis that's ismic due to the presence of the um, foraminal compromise on the roots, and that, of course, can be worse with a higher-grade slip. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, retrolisthesis as well. So this is a different positioning. This is where the cephalad body uh, uh, sublux is posteriorly. So I, I took, put some representative pictures in here. Uh, there's a patient that uh, has an L23 retrolisthesis. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the generalized findings. There's a, a couple of pictures. The A and B pictures are somebody with a L45 retrolisthesis. So some studies I looked at when I looked, put together this talk, you know, what, how do you get this? Why do, you, why do people have um, retrolisthesis development in the aging spine? What are the associated factors? There's a study out of the Chinese literature uh, and the Korean literature. And uh, basically uh, what, what happens is I think retrolisthesis based on my review of these studies and the, 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 the summaries of these studies are that uh, it appears to be a compensatory degenerative mechanism of the vertebral interspace to maintain sagittal alignment. So as we become more degenerative as we age, in order to help compensate our sagittal alignment, the, one of the bodies will slide posteriorly to compensate and create better alignment sagittally uh, with this retrolisthesis development. Uh, we do the, the studies that I've pointed out here to the left, um, the retrolisthesis is associated with lower pelvic incidence, lower pelvic tilt, lower, lower overall lumbar lordosis, lower sacral slope, and lower SVA. So you're compensating for your uh, postural position. It's also associated with higher uh, thoracic kyphosis. So the, the representative uh, long lateral film on the right, uh, the B picture, will show that uh, kind of that classic picture of what happens when you, the retrolisthesis. So you're trying to compensate for the change in your posture by pushing posteriorly uh, through your degenerative segments. So, uh, that's, so retrolisthesis is a compensatory uh, uh, mechanism for uh, maintaining sagittal alignment uh, in a degenerative spine. It doesn't mean it's not associated with pathology, but it's a different pathology than an anterolisthesis. Uh, we also know that there's lateralisthesis. So we'll see uh, uh, shifting of the spine in the coronal plane where one vertebra will shift to the side of the other one. Um, and so I uh, looked at some studies uh, looking at lateral asthesis specifically in terms of predicting, you know, if it's present, is it associated with worsening disease and worsening pain and worsening progression of an underlying degenerative condition. Um, so the summary of the findings of the studies on the left uh, are that lateral asthesis is most commonly seen in patients with associated degenerative scoliotic curvature. It is most likely a compensatory mechanism to maintain coronal alignment, much like the retrolisthesis is a compensatory mechanism to maintain sagittal alignment. This is likely a compensatory mechanism to maintain coronal alignment during curve regression due to aging. It is associated often with segmental disc degeneration, and it can create its own pathology. So um, it, it can worsen foraminal stenosis in a degenerative curve. So it can cause neurologic symptoms as well. It can cause and be associated uh, with um, uh, painful conditions, but the presence of a uh, lateral asthesis itself is not, has, was not shown, at least uh, looking at uh, uh, Vedat's study and uh, Sigbervin's study uh, and Serena Hughes' study. Um, it was not associated with curve progression risk, and it was not necessarily associated with the presence of pain in a degenerative scoliotic curvature. So it can create its own symptoms, but it's not generally associated with curve progression or, or generalized pain related to the condition itself. Um, so how do you make the diagnosis of a spondylolisthesis? Well, almost all of our normal imaging modalities will show it. X-rays, uh, you can get standing film, uh, flexion extension X-rays and long alignment films will show the spondylolisthesis. Uh, MRIs are used to evaluate other uh, pathologies associated with the spondylolisthesis, uh, such as stenosis. Uh, CT scans are probably the gold standard still for evaluating uh, bony deficits, such as an ismic spondylolisthesis to look for a PARS defect. And then uh, bone scans and spec CTs, which we've talked about previously, we're using more often now to evaluate for stress reactions in the PARs and or facets that may be contributory to the disease process associated with these uh, uh, listesis. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about instability. I, 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 this is the ESLAC slide, I, I'll call it. Um, you know, the flexion, flexion extension x-rays were typically thought to be the gold standard and the utilized for uh, uh, determining whether or not a spondylolisthesis was indeed uh, unstable. 
And then one of the other things we can look at is our, our effusions within the facets in a patient with spondylolisthesis felt to be uh, uh, associated with a higher risk of uh, instability. Um, uh, the, the, basically, the, the studies on the uh, left that I included here, the Kashgar study is the one that I, that I think we've started to talk about more extensively in terms of, is there really any additional value to getting flexion extension x-rays when you compare the supine MRI to the standing neutral uh, x-ray. So the summary of these studies is uh, the value of flexion extension x-rays to evaluate segmental instability is variable. So uh, if you look at the second study there, this Asian study looked at the influence of posture when you actually, what position do you get your flexion extension x-rays in? So there's a large difference in the degree of slip noted between sitting, standing, and lateral decubitus positioning during x-ray and instability is best seen in lateral decubitus positioning for the x-ray with a flexion and extension. Um, and there's no relationship they found between the degree of instability that they saw in flexion extension x-rays and the presence of facet effusions on MRI. So, so they didn't find a correlation. Now, it doesn't mean that facet effusions are indicative of instability, but they cannot correlate the degree of instability with the presence of the effusions. In the Kazakar study, <clears throat> they found a 90% correlation between finding three millimeters of slip differential comparing the supine MRI to the standing neutral X-ray, but getting flexion extension X-rays only created a 16% additional confirmation of instability. So their feeling was that if you confirmed the difference uh, between a supine MRI and a standing neutral X-ray and showed a greater than three millimeter slip difference, this corresponded to symptom presence and uh, correlated with treatment recommendations for stabilization. Uh, so I think uh, this is the study we're using now for uh, to, to essentially stop getting flexion extension x-rays, the combination of what we're seeing with the variability in flexion extension x-ray positioning and potentially not the, the need because it doesn't really help us clinically. So treat, we'll go now to treatments for spondylolisthesis. Uh, obviously there's, you can treat this condition non-operatively. You treat it like any other back pain or neurologic symptomatology condition of the spine, physical therapy to work on core strengthening and flexibility. You can do injections uh, and uh, uh, epidurals work for spinal stenosis. They may help with some of the symptoms associated with spondylolisthesis. And if you're concerned that a pain generator is indeed something wrong with the PARS and something that has a PARS defect, uh, the PARS injections can help with diagnosis. Um, but if we're going to talk about treatment, we're going to talk about what, you know, the surgical treatment associated with these conditions, you know, we're going to have to go back to our principles. So when somebody comes in with a symptomatic spondylolisthesis, regardless of type, we have to go to where we have to go with anything we have to treat, uh, the principles of neurologic decompression when there are neurologic symptoms, stabilization of segmental instability, if we define there is instability, you want to create a durable outcome so that when you do treat a patient, they stay well. And then we're going to have to take into account that uh, these uh, uh, conditions both are creative of deformity. Um, they are responses in creating deformity. And if we're going to uh, treat them, we want to basically make sure that we take our, 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 our treatment options and, and try and minimize the amount of deformity we either uh, preserve at a segment or create at a segment. So we go, we're looking for deformity to correction in our treatments. So what are our surgical options? Well, if somebody comes in with a um, symptomatic spondylolisthesis with neurologic symptoms, we, there have been studies that have been done that look at decompression without doing a stabilization of the instability or the, the deformity. So the, the studies that, that were done for ismic spondylolisthesis, uh, Gill did it a long time ago, a Gill laminectomy is a complete removal of the lamina and the PARs at the level that's affected. Uh, they showed uh, good results in the 1955 study that was done for the gill laminectomy for symptomatic ismic spondylolisthesis at L5S1. However, this was not borne out in subsequent studies with a high degree of slip progression rate, which you'd expect when you remove the entire lamina and the PARs at the level that you're treating. And you're putting a ton more stress on the disc, so of course you see increased disc degeneration. So I think decompression alone for an ismic spondylolisthesis has largely fallen out of favor because of poor outcomes. When you talk about degenerative spondylolisthesis, there have been multiple uh, recent studies looking at um, um, uh, comparing decompression versus fusion and then fusion with and without instrumentation. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the consensus here is uh, there's better, more durable outcomes with uh, concomitant fusion plus decompression over decompression along with degenerative spondylolisthesis. So I, I kept this article in from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2016. 
that they did laminectomy for plus fusion versus laminectomy alone for lumbar spondylolisthesis. I found this interesting because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine and not spine or uh, journal of bone and joint surgery or neurologic uh, or the neurology uh, literature. So, but uh, they compared decompression alone versus the fusion group. They looked at SF36 and ODIs and there's a significant improvement in the uh, patient's uh, baseline uh, from the ba patient's baseline to uh, uh, when you compare the fusion improvements to the decompression alone uh, over time. So this was a, the fusions provided better initial uh, um, uh, um, results uh, from a SF36 and ODI standpoint, and then it was more durable over time. So you can see the numbers here. So for the conclusion of the study was among patients with degenerative grade one spondylolisthesis, the addition of lumbar spinal fusion to laminectomy was associated with slightly greater but clinically meaningful improvement in overall physical health related quality of life than laminectomy alone. And I think the vast majority of studies uh, kind of correspond to this finding as well when you review the, the spine literature. Um, so again, back to treatment, uh, again, surgical decompression can be considered, and I think for degenerative spondylolisthesis, I, I think for isthmic spondylolisthesis, I don't think that's true, but you can consider decompression in, a, in an isolate in certain patients where you, where, where the, you don't think you need to stabilize them based on the uh, uh, imaging parameters you're looking at, age, and some other factors play a role in that too. Um, there have been studies that have looked at the different fusion techniques. Uh, all post, there are studies that look at all posterior fusions with and without instrumentation. There have been studies done that look at all anterior instrumentation for spondylolisthesis of varying types, circumferential fusion with various inner body techniques, uh, and then studies that have been done for spondylolisthesis with and without decompression and with and without reduction. And again, I think your technique for what you choose to do has to be based on your surgical goals or what you're trying to, to, to accomplish when you're treating a patient with a spondylolisthesis. So each patient has to be evaluated. Uh, their imaging has to be looked at. Their symptoms have to be looked at. Their underlying condition has to be looked at. And then you've got to pick a technique uh, that uh, will meet your surgical goals. Uh, I will say that based on my review of the literature, the trends, um, there's no statistical difference in outcomes with or without decompression. So a fusion with or without decompression can be considered. So you have to use your surgical judgment on whether you think a patient needs to be uh, directly decompressed uh, versus just stabilized at the level you're treating. Uh, instrumentation does increase fusion rates. So that's been shown over multiple different pathologies. So if you're going to fuse the spine, if you instrument it, you're gonna get a higher fusion rate, which should improve your clinical outcome. Um, we know that circumferential fusions improve clinical outcomes because they, inf uh, they improve fusion rates as well. Um, reduction of a spondylolisthesis has a higher risk of developing or, or creating an iatrogenic neurologic injury. And this is more important if you're going to be treating higher grade slip or a much larger deformity associated with a spondylolisthesis. <clears throat> and then uh, studies also show that improving focal kyphosis and general lumbar lordosis, again, back to the improving the deformity, uh, when you're treating as uh, spondylolisthesis uh, leads to better uh, health-related quality outcome study or outcome uh, uh, results. A uh, little bit of a discussion. You could give a whole talk on spondylolisthesis and deformity, but again, my, my caveat here will be that if you're going to treat a spondylolisthesis, you should consider focal and global sagittal alignment in your treatment planning. Um, both ismic and degenerative spondylolisthesis have a negative impact on lumbar lordosis. If you think about it, they are segmentally kyphotic for the most part. Generally, the degenerative changes that occur, especially in the adult population, even with an ismic spondylolisthesis, the, 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 both conditions generally tend to create uh, basically kyphosis at the segment they occur. Uh, and then uh, there's compensatory mechanisms that occur that can create hyperlordosis in the lumbar spine to compensate and eventually your pelvis has to compensate if you can no longer lordose your spine enough to compensate for the deformity. So um, if you fail to consider the, the focal and the global sagittal issues associated with your treatment, you may be forcing the patient into a worse situation long-term and ultimately they will need a larger corrective surgery later because of the treatment that you've provided. So again, you've got to consider the, the, both the local and the global deformity in your treatment plan. Um, so conclusions of kind of my review and uh, looking at my own patient treatments and uh, um, experience is spondylolisthesis when symptomatic requires thoughtful evaluation of treatment consideration for each patient. 
it is more than just instability. There are neurologic symptoms that can occur. You can have stenosis both centrally and foraminally that can need to be treated in your treatment plan. You can have deformity that's both segmental and global. Uh, and in my adult populations that I see, uh, ischemic disease is often associated with degenerative changes, which are driving the patient's symptoms. It's not just the deformity and it's not just the instability pattern. It is the fact that these patients now have an arthritic change associated with the underlying condition that's driving their disease and their symptoms associated with their disease. So uh, one other conclusion based on the literature is circumferential fusion tends towards better clinical and functional outcomes because you're increasing your fusion rate. Um, the ALIF and uh, lateral surgery allow for indirect decompression because you're, you're able to more powerfully restore disc space heights. You're probably also able to get better segmental alignment using these techniques, uh, which can help with both local and global deformity correction. Um, that, one of the things I will comment on is I think lateral surgery is safe and effective for spondylolisthesis treatment above L5. Uh, I think it's especially powerful for patients that have developed scoliotic curvatures with associated lateral stesis that creates foraminal disease as symptomatic. It is probably uh, uh, the best treatment, in my opinion, for symptomatic foraminal disease associated with a scoliotic deformity in the older patient because of the power of the indirect decompression and the ability to correct the uh, lateral stesis and the uh, focal deformity at that level using a lateral surgery. Uh, and finally, consider focal and global sagittal alignment in your treatment planning, even with low grade slip. So while it may not seem like a big deal that you've got a grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis, you still need to uh, take into consideration uh, the overall uh, patient's alignment picture when you're making your treatment plan so that you don't lock them into a kyphotic or a neutral position that's ultimately going to give them problems down the road. So that's what I've got for today. So that was my half hour. I think I did pretty good. Awesome. Thanks, bro. Yep. You know, I remember reading it when it came out, but it's been a while. The parameters for that Benzel New England Journal study, was it grade one that, that moved on FME or, or do, do you remember, or does anybody remember? I don't remember. Um, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. Some evidence of instability in addition to the And then maybe an open question to the group. I mean, how do you guys feel about reduction? I, I know that, you know, there's a lot of data that suggests that it's not critical, um, but most of that's one or two year follow-up. And I wonder in the long term how important it is to, to get a good reduction in terms of just sort of the biomechanical integrity of, of somebody's spawn. We got a bunch of muted microphones. Um, I have not... It's interesting, since I've gone to more anterior surgery for these, Annie, um, the, the, for me, the reduction tends to be something that comes through the anterior or lateral approach. I tend to get some reduction consistently using- Yeah, it's an afterthought. It just happens via the approach, whether you're trying to or not. I don't, yeah. I don't try, I generally don't try and do more than I get from the anterior surgery. So I don't try and reduce more than that with posterior fixation. I think it puts a ton of strain on my posterior instrumentation to try and reduce that. And I don't think there's been a, I not noticed, again, I, I haven't compared, you know, you'd almost have to do a randomized study to look at people you try to reduce versus people you haven't to see if there's some clinical benefit. Um, but I'm not aware of that, especially for majority of degenerative spondies and even my ischemic spondies that I treat are more Based, in other words, they're they're degenerative conditions that I'm treating. Yeah, I, 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 it's a very tough thing to study, Hanny, just because of the the relatively minor uh, degrees of compensation that go on around it. Um, you know, just looking back at our segmental compensation study, yeah. really tough. You have to have really big numbers to try to tease it out. But I. I I still pretty firmly believe that it's important that when you have a residual listhesis, it, it, it translates the sagittal vertical axis forward as an example. And it right. puts mo even more premium on the other levels to basically compensatorily bring the SVA back. So they have to angle more than they, they would if it was, it was reduced. So I, you know, I think, I think that 
that Jamie's right, the power of the, that lateral or anterior uh, ligament to taxis and reducing is helpful. And, and, you know, I think there's even some, some additional effort you can put on segmentally uh, uh, realigning in, in the uh, sagittal plane as well as translating to optimize the level. And, and that, you know, it, it, we may not be able to tease it out easily in the data, but on a biomechanical theoretical basis, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for, yeah. thanks for giving the talk to you. No problem. Appreciate you, Jamie. No, no problem. Happy to do it. Do you think, uh, I'm sorry, just one more quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Isak, um, about uh, pedicle screw fixation, um, you know, just going towards larger screws if you're going to, or, or trying to trend towards larger screws if you're going to try to put that posterior directed force on the, on the pedicles for reduction. I mean, I, I don't know, what are your thoughts about that versus, you know, I guess cement augmentation? I, I don't know, I just, I, I do, I like Dr. Ruffy, I do worry about it. And I've seen the, the screws start to pull out. Um, I've seen that a couple of times too with an attempted reduction maneuver and then sort of back off like, okay, that that's not gonna work. In, so we'll leave it where we are, so. In, in what? context in a deformity or in a no 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 a like a spot. grade one slip and you yeah. kind of reduce it you know uh, 50 percent or, or or more and then you kind of want to go for gold and then you see yeah. that that little movement of the screw or the little subtle pull out or it doesn't feel right or whatever so I'm trying to yeah i i, I think that's really that. that's probably not worth it if you're causing that kind of failure but you know that there's there's a couple of things i would think about number one imagine that you're you're doing that uh all from a posterior approach and and your demand for the reduction is entirely on the screws and then on top of that you've got sort of a, a weak anterior structural support where 80 percent of your load is transmitted that that makes me much more worried about doing it with a a no inner body or a posterior inner body construct number one sure. number two you see when we do this, if you if you release the front well, you get most of your reduction there and then you release your facet so you're not demanding as much on your screws. It, you're, you're probably in pretty good stead with, with, with that residual structural integrity in the front. And then finally, you, you have to use your judgment. If, you, if you're working with an osteoporotic patient and your screws don't feel that that good going in, you're going to be really leery about demanding much on them. And then you may even cement augment on top of that and then not demand on them. But, you know, th those are the nuances and the art of what we do. You have to, you have to decide if, if a little reduction is really worth it. If you're already somewhat concerned about the structural integrity or the, uh, the uh, integrity of the screw bone interface. Rob, I couldn't agree more. I think the, uh, especially in the more severe cases, without release, putting all the load on the screw to try to reduce is is probably not a good idea. And uh, I think you know you do the reduction, you do the release, and then use the screws for fixation, and not really use as a means of reduction. In general, I think the smaller deformities or uh, you know slip is 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 probably okay. But it, you know, Bob is exactly right. Uh, you know, not having that anterior release or disc release or whatever is needed, uh, and putting all the screws, in, uh, all the pressure on the screws, is not uh, a good idea. <clears throat> Yeah, especially if it's an L5-S1, Rob, and the S1 fixation is not great, and you're trying to you know, pull five back off of fixation at that segment. Yeah, you could, for me, you could really break down, you know, the treatment options uh, by subtype. So, I mean, I, I think the principles stay the same, but, you know, there's some nuances to treating ischemic spondylolisthesis at L5-S1 versus treating a degenerative spondylolisthesis at L4-5. Uh, just they're just they're different animals in a way so um 
Yeah, you have to really rethink your, sometimes you have to think your, rethink your treatment plan. Thanks, Jamie. This is Kam. I have a question for you regarding the lateral listhesis. What um, uh, I've seen quoted uh, like uh, seven millimeters as uh, as a pathologic number um, as to the amount of lateral listhesis that's clinically significant. But uh, but I've seen also a lot of people really start decompensating it earlier earlier amounts of slip because it then is associated with a lot more rotation and a lot more issues. Uh, what's your sense of of, of how to, uh, uh, what amount of lateral anesthesis is something that is concerning and should it be treated a little sooner before the scoliosis worsens, for example? Well, I'll tell you, so my review of that, so I used to think, you know, the, that it was a pathologic process in and of itself. And then I looked at the, the study that uh, Sagan Badat had done and Serena Hu had done up in uh, uh, San Francisco. And they didn't see uh, association of pain or curve progression associated with the presence of that. And I don't think they had enough patients in that study to really break down, you know, the degree of how much it is. I, I didn't see that like there was a number. I, I couldn't find a study that gave me a number, like a certain number of lateral asthesis. But it's, I do agree with you. It's a compensatory mechanism for, the, for a patient to try and improve their cor own coronal alignment. So I think when you're seeing these higher grade lateral asthesis, you're seeing the patient's body trying to compensate to a point where it, now you're starting to create severe pathologic process associated with the compensation for the worsening coronal deformity that's related to the worsening degenerative condition associated with it. Does that make sense? It does. Yep. So, so I think you're, to answer your question, I, I think that you're, I don't, I don't think you treat it any differently. I, I think the decision to treat is based on symptom presentation at the time the patient comes in. Um, and then you pick your tech, technique of treatment, I didn't see anything, uh, I didn't look for a study that combined, compared like a lateral or an anterior surgical treatment to an all posterior surgical treatment for somebody with lateral asthesis associated with their degenerative scoliosis. I didn't see anything like that in the literature. I didn't look for that actually. Uh, I guess that would be one consideration is if you've got really bad coronal deformity now, are you better off treating it through a combined anterior and posterior approach or can you still do it all posterior? I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Um, I recall that same study. I can't remember what it is, but you're right. There's a study from, gosh, it's probably in the 90s now <laughs> um, um, that, that, that described seven, over seven millimeters as a clinically symptomatic number for lateral asthesis, but uh, I can't even recall the quality of the study, but I, I, I do know that number too. 